All right, guys. Hey, so here's what I'm going to suggest. Um, if you look at the homework packet, that's your cue to look at the homework packet. Guys, if you look at the homework packet, all we have done in its entirety, this seems really loud. All that we've done in its entirety is assignment number one. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. Then, guys, if you look at assignment number two, you'll notice that we skipped the first page. We did the second page, or you should have. And then we have not yet got to the third page because we didn't complete that material. Also correct? Okay. So, guys, go back then to assignment number one. And let's talk about what we learned from assignment number one, which will then transition into what we learned in this, or what we applied in assignment number two, which will then transition back into our notes and we'll reconnect with these notes that we already started and we'll pick up where we left off and we'll have about 30 minutes of new material and then you'll get the arrest of uh, assignment number two done and then you won't have homework over the weekend that should have been part of Christmas break if we were in Provo District. Hmm? We can make this happen. So guys, going back to assignment number one, what did you, what did you learn? What were the big ideas out of assignment number one? How about this? What do the big arrows represent? Go ahead. Overall polarities, right? And so guys, what are those overall polarities the sum of? What are they the result of? Okay, so the strongest atom, right? And guys, you may remember that when we did these, what we actually did is we drew in a bunch of little arrows, right? And when we drew in the little arrows, what direction did the little arrows point? At the strongest elements. And so it really shows us the direction that these electrons are drifting towards the strongest atoms. So oxygen is stronger than carbon, so it goes that way. Chlorine is stronger, chlorine is stronger, so the carbon's being pulled apart in all three directions. But then, guys, we said there's an overall um, uh, polarity to the molecule, and how did we know that goes towards the oxygen? It's the oxygen is stronger than chlorine, so this guy is more polar than either of those bonds, so that's the overall polarity. Is it coming back to you? A little bit? So guys, similarly then, fluorine is stronger than hydrogen. But guys, why is number three not polar? What makes a molecule overall, what makes a molecule polar? What makes a molecule nonpolar? Remembering this has been weeks and weeks. Go ahead, Caitlin. Exactly. That's exactly, it's not, yes. So guys, it's all about symmetry. So if a molecule is symmetrical, it is nonpolar. And if a molecule is not symmetrical or not balanced, that makes it polar. Is that coming back to you? Is that okay? So then guys do this. As we graded this homework assignment, we talked about two surefire things that will always tell you that a molecule is not symmetrical and therefore polar, and that's question 19 in this homework assignment. So guys, go down to question 19 and remind yourself about what we learned. So what molecules, what is present to make a molecule polar every single time? What are the two things? Go ahead. Good. The atoms around the molecule are not the same. So if you look at the outlying atoms, if they're not all the same, that guy's going to be polar. What's the other one? Go ahead. Unbonded. Unbonded hey, you guys, is this coming back? Unbonded electrons. So guys, if you look here, oxygen is not chlorine. That thing is polar. These are not the same atoms. That guy is not polar. Here we've got unbonded electrons. That guy is polar. So guys, when we have either atoms that are not the same or unbonded electrons, that makes the molecule polar. And then we draw on the polarity arrows. If neither of those are true, then, um, then it's nonpolar. Is that coming back to you? Ask questions if it's not. You guys okay? You're sure? So let's go through the rest of this assignment and make sure you got it. So guys, looking at number five, no unbonded electrons. All the atoms are the same. That guy's nonpolar. Looking at number six, nitrogen is not hydrogen. That guy is polar. Looking at number seven, unbonded electrons. That's polar. All good? You good? 
All right, so Lauren, you need to grab your homework from last time and your class notes that we took right before Christmas break. So guys, I'm gonna get rid of this if we're okay. You guys okay? All right, so then guys going from there, turn to assignment number two and let's look at what we did there. And it goes like this. Guys, the only part of assignment number two that we could do was the second page. And so what we did on the second page stretched it a little bit, and we talked about molecules being more polar than other molecules. So guys, looking at example number one, we know that this is polar because chlorine is not hydrogen and bromine is not hydrogen, so we know they're both polar, but then the question is, which one is more polar? And do you remember how we figured out more polar? Exactly. We subtracted. Guys, you look up the electronegativities of these elements and you subtract and the molecule that has the biggest difference in electronegativity will be the one that is the most lopsided and therefore the one that is most polar. So guys, for example, here we've got carbons in the middle, but chlorine is more electronegative than bromine, so those differences would be bigger, making that more polar. Then guys, here we've got hydrogens in both molecules, but here we've got oxygen and here we've got sulfur. Oxygen is more electronegative than sulfur, so that and that's, more, that's more polar and so on. Is that coming back to you? Questions there, so it's all about subtraction. So guys, let's review. Here's what we know. So in assignment number one, we learned that molecules are polar if they don't have the same atoms or if there's unbonded electrons, and we talked about drawing the polarity arrows. Now in this assignment, we understand that some molecules are more polar than others, and that's because of their electronegativity differences. The ones with the bigger differences will be the more electronegative molecule, or the more polar molecules. You guys good? Is that a great way to start 2019? Liar. All right. You guys okay? Because that's what we're going to build on today. So guys, if you got questions, ask. Holly, you look overwhelmed. Oh, I know, right? So here's my question for you. How long did you lay in bed last night before you could finally fall asleep? And it's not because you were excited for the first day of school. Yeah, see? I was like 90 minutes. I could not fall asleep. I hated it. It was not good. I mean, my body thought it was still New Year's. I had to stay up till midnight. You guys okay? All right, this is going away. I know, right? I know, I fell asleep watching Avengers at 8 o'clock and then couldn't get to sleep when I needed to. Well, and the, but the thing is, is your dad's in good company because um, Skyward thinks it's a B-Day too. <laughs> I know, it's not good. All right. Okay, guys, here we go. This is, this is where we're going to pick up today. You should find in your notebook, not in the homework, but in the class notes section of your notebook, you should find something that looks surprisingly like this. You found it? Because guys, this is where we're going to pick up today. These are going to be the foundation for what we're going to talk about today. And this is also going to be a, the underlying information for what we're going to do in lab on Monday. So guys, if you don't have these in your notes because you were gone or your notebook fell apart or whatever, guys, draw these Lewis dot structures really quickly because you're going to need them for the rest of the day. So once you've got these Lewis dot structures, what I want to do is I want to, I want to pen in the information that you should have in your notes. It should already be there, but we'll step through the logic. And then guys, once you've stepped through the logic, we'll then uh, pick up from there and uh, keep going. So Mar, are you going to take chemistry over at Tim? You're going to have Mr. Richards. Uh, yeah, he is. He, um, he, he we, uh, 
We, we used to spend a lot of time together. He would come, when he was first getting started, he used to come over and sort of work with me. So you may find a lot of the stuff, because he does the year different order than we do. So you're gonna do some of the stuff with him that you've already done with me, and you're gonna find you probably already have the homework done because he uses a lot of my stuff. So there you go. Yeah, my son comes home with homework, and I'm like, Cody, I wrote that. So, all right, you guys good? Are, you, are we good? Okay, so guys, this is the logic then that you need to have a connection with. So guys, talk to me about CH4. Is this guy polar, yes or no? How do you know no? It's symmetrical. And guys, again, the tests are this. Rachel got us thinking, oh gosh. So guys, Rachel got us thinking that if we look at these outside atoms, they are all the same. That would lead us to think symmetrical. Also, there are no unbonded electrons on the central atom, so that would also make us think that that's symmetrical and nonpolar. You guys good on that? Okay, so now guys looking at this dude. Is this thing polar? Absolutely, because if you look, we've got unbonded electrons. Unbonded electrons cause bending, which makes it not symmetrical. And then guys, similarly on water, that would also be uh, polar because of the unbonded electrons. You guys good there? Okay, so now what we've got to do is figure out which one is more polar. And in order to do that, you may remember that we needed the electronegativities and we started doing subtractions. And guys, when we did the subtractions, the logic actually kind of goes like this. So carbon is stronger than hydrogen, so these move in this direction. So those are all moving towards the carbon. Oxygen is stronger than carbon, so that's going that way. Oxygen is stronger than hydrogen, so that's going that way. And guys, what's the overall polarity? Yeah, it's all sort of closing in, and it's going like that. And then this goes like this, this goes like that, so that goes like that. Is that coming back to you? Okay, then at this point, we had to figure out which one was more polar. And if you remember what we did, we said we only look at the bonds that are right next to the polarity arrow. You don't have to look at the rest, just look at the ones next to the polarity arrow. So guys, if we look at this one, and if we look at this one, we need to figure out which one's got the greater electronegativity difference. So we've got oxygens in the middle, so that's common. Here we've got hydrogens, so that's carbon. But here, guys, carbon is stronger than the oxygen so this or I'm sorry carbon is stronger than this hydrogen comparing and so the idea is this would have the greater dis difference so that would be the more electronegative or the, and therefore the more polar does that make sense is that okay or should we do the math do you want to see the math or do the math okay so guys the idea is this and my brain is fried so I may need this so guys, the idea then is look at the bonds next to the polarity arrow and subtract. So when we do this subtraction, the difference between those is 1.24. Did I do that right? Because you already have these, right? And then this is also 1.24. So we have the differences there. And this is 1.24. But then when we do this subtraction, we, what's the difference? 0.89. When we do this subtraction, the 3.44 minus the 2.55 is 0.89. So the idea is here we have 1.24 and 0.89. Here we have 1.24 and 1.24. So the bigger the difference, the more polar the bonds, therefore the more polar molecule. So this molecule would be more polar than that one because this one's got the bigger differences. I'm glad you had me stop. Does that make sense? Is that okay? Is that, you're good. Do you, are we good on that? You're okay? Because guys, if you understand that, we're going to spend the next 20 to 25 minutes and we're going to talk about so what? What does it matter that CH4 is not polar? What does it matter that water is the most polar? How, what, the so what's. So guys, we're going to do 20 to 25 minutes of so what's and then you're going to get your homework done. So if you understand this, can we do the so what's? You guys ready to go? Okay. So guys, first of all, let me lay out for you what we're going to do. And this is where you want to start taking notes. So guys, these then are all the so what's. I got to let all this come in. So guys, this then's the idea. And this is where you want to start scratching stuff down in your notes. So guys, the idea goes like this. We talked about these things before called intermolecular forces. And we said that intermolecular forces are attractions between polar molecules that stick them together. Do you guys remember that? 
It's in your notes, but I know it's been a while. Maybe that's something I didn't think to review. So guys, we talked about these things called IMFs or intermolecular forces. And these are the sticky, the sticky attractions between polar molecules. That's what an intermolecular force is, is an attraction between polar molecules that sticks these guys together. Well guys, it turns out that the strength of those forces determines the physical properties of these substances, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So guys, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out for you the properties that we're going to talk about, then we're going to talk about them one at a time, and then guys, we're going to wrap it up and call it a day. So guys, these are the things we're going to talk about. First of all, phase. You guys already know, how many phases of matter are there? When things get cold, they become solid, and then they melt and become liquid, and then they boil and become gas. So guys, you got solids, liquids, and gases. Some of you may understand that this is actually not the complete list. There's actually somewhere between 10 and 14 different phases of matter. There's Bose-Einstein condensates and plasmas and supercritical fluids and all these other really cool things. But these are the ones that exist here on Earth. So guys, what determines if a substance is a solid, a liquid, or a gas? And the answer is the strength of the intermolecular forces. What does the strength of the intermolecular forces depend upon? The polarity of the molecule. And you're going to see all of that in just a second. So guys, that's the first one we're going to talk about. Then we're going to focus in on the properties of liquids. And when we talk about the properties of liquids, there are actually four properties of liquids that we're going to talk about. And we'll go through each one of those, and then we'll wrap it up and call it a day. So guys, the first one we're going to talk about is volatility. And I'll define these for you. So guys, volatility is defined as the ability of a liquid to evaporate. You guys doing okay? I forget how fast you guys can go. We okay? Can you go a little faster? Okay. So then guys, the next one we're going to talk about is boiling point. Not surprisingly, that is the temperature at which a substance has enough energy to boil, to become a liquid. You guys, what temperature does water boil at? So 212 Fahrenheit, do you know it in Celsius? 100. Just checking. So guys, that's the second one we're going to look at. Then the third one we're going to look at is what is called cohesion. So cohesion is an attractive force within a substance, <clears throat> kind of like codependent. If you're in a weird codependent relationship, there's these weird things going on within the relationship. And then guys, the last one we're going to do is adhesion, like adhesive, which is glue. This is an attractive force between two different substances. So guys, that's your laundry list. This is what we're going to do today. We're going to take those molecules that you drew the arrows in just a second ago and put in order. And guys, we're going to talk about whether they're a solid, a liquid, or a gas, and why. And then we're going to talk about their adhesive forces and what about their cohesive forces, but we're only going to do that for the liquids, not the solids or gases. Again, this will take us about 20 minutes. We'll wrap up. You'll get your homework done. And then we'll go to lab on Monday. You know how long it's been since we've been to lab? Well. <laughs> Yes. Thank you, Jason. It's been since last year. It's been a whole year. 
But guys, we only went to lab once last unit or last quarter. Yeah, we only, we did three. Yeah, because one of them, remember, was the cut and paste periodic table lab, and then the other one was the molecular structure lab. That was the last time we've been in lab was the flame test lab. It was. No, 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 no. You're right. We we did multiple labs right before Christmas, and they were meaningful, right? But we uh, didn't go to lab to do the lab. So given that, we've done four labs in this room, including the. Um, did you guys know about the halogens lab? Were you guys a part of that conversation? It got really not okay. All right, never mind. Let's keep going. You guys good? You all caught up? So guys, again, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about these, well, five things-ish relative to the molecules we just drew. We're going to talk about their phase. We're going to talk about their volatility, boiling point, cohesive and adhesive properties, and that's going to be it. You guys ready to go? Okay, so guys, this then is the logic, and I, I'm going to start, and, and, and guys, this is all going to be about logic and reasoning. So it goes like this. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about phase, but we're going to talk about phase, guys, go back up in your notes, for CH4, for CH3OH, and for H2O. So we're going to talk about what phase is CH4. Is this a solid, a liquid, or a gas? What about CH3OH, solid, liquid, or gas? What about water? We already know the answer, solid, liquid, or gas at room temperature. We already know the answer, but we're going to talk about why. So guys, let's get started by talking about CH4. So you don't need to write this down, but I'll, I'll tell you when to write. But guys, it goes like this. Imagine that we had more than one CH4 molecule. Imagine that we had billions and billions and billions of these molecules, or at least seven. Okay? So guys, if we have a bunch of these molecules, let's talk about them as individuals. Are they polar? They are not polar, right? They're symmetrical and therefore not polar. So guys, if they are not polar, they do not have intermolecular forces. They don't attract each other. So guys, if they don't attract each other, what do you suppose they do when they all get together? And the answer is they spread out. If they don't attract, they spread, and as they spread out, they form a gas. And guys, this is not, well, you know what, let's turn. So guys, the logic is this. So CH4 molecules are not polar. Because CH4 molecules are not polar, they don't attract each other. They don't have intermolecular forces. So when we get a bunch of CH4 molecules together, guys, watch. They do this. Here they come. Right now, I am filling the room with CH4 molecules. Because guys, CH4 molecules are actually just natural gas. And when these molecules come out, it doesn't rain CH4. It doesn't turn into a liquid. When these things come out, they go like this, and they fill the room as a gas. Now, guys, why do they fill the room as a gas? Why do they spread out? Why don't they clump together? Because they don't have intermolecular forces. And why don't they have intermolecular forces? Because they're not polar. And guys, guess what? That's true of any molecule that you know to be a gas. So when you breathe in, what are you breathing? Besides natural gas now, and it stinks. Oxygen, nonpolar. What else? Did you guys know that most of the air you breathe is not oxygen? It's nitrogen, also nonpolar. Guys, what else is in the air that we breathe? Carbon dioxide, nonpolar. Guys, Every single molecule that you know to be a gas, you now know is nonpolar and therefore symmetrical. Guys, that's always true. Go ahead. Yeah, so carbon dioxide minus its electrons, well, I'll put them in. Carbon dioxide looks like this. Carbon monoxide looks like this. 
So carbon monoxide is actually triple bonded. The reason that it's, because you know carbon monoxide is deadly, right? The reason is because this is what oxygen looks like. And oxygen um, is frighteningly similar to carbon dioxide. And you've got this stuff in your body called hemoglobin. And your hemoglobin is like a little dump truck that grabs a hold of oxygen and carries it throughout your body. Um, the problem is, is that hemoglobin can grab a hold of O2 and carry it around your body and then let go of it. If hemoglobin grabs a hold of CO, carbon monoxide, it's just about the same shape and size. So hemoglobin can grab a hold of it, but it can't let go. And so the problem is, is that every hemoglobin molecule that locks onto a carbon monoxide is not available to carry oxygen and you suffocate. So literally, you're still breathing oxygen, but the carbon monoxide has tied up your hemoglobin and can't carry the oxygen anymore, and you suffocate while you're still breathing oxygen. Yeah, it's horrible stuff, but that's how, that's why carbon monoxide is, is, is deadly. So guys, this then is the thing that you've got to understand, and also what I would strongly encourage you to put in your notes, it's in blue. So guys, this is the idea, CH4 has no polarity. Because CH4 has no polarity, does it have intermolecular forces? No. Therefore, guys, it's a gas. By the way, do you remember the triple dots? What do they mean? Therefore, right. So no polarity, therefore no intermolecular forces, therefore it's a gas. But guys, this works in all directions. If you know something is a gas, you know it doesn't have intermolecular forces, therefore you know it doesn't have polarity. Go ahead, Courtney. What about water? Exactly. And so what you actually, I don't want to, Courtney's thought was, what about water? Because water can be a gas. What do we call water gas? Or right, water vapor steam, right? So we can turn water into a gas. Um, but what does it take? heater energy. So uh, <laughs> I don't want to tell you because this is what the lab is about. Let's okay, let's let's do this. Hold for a minute. Because you're right that water can be a gas. So if water is a gas is water vapor, it then no longer has intermolecular forces, right? Exactly, and we'll get there as well, but we need to talk about what you have to do to get water to be a gas because water is polar. And when, I didn't want to do this, but you asked, so we will. We're going to bring up water in just a minute and talk about it, and then we'll talk about how that happens, which is actually going to be one of the big ideas in the lab, but we'll just talk about it. Go ahead, Mark. You tapered off at the end. Because water can be a gas what? Oh, heavens, yes. Ab yeah, so, yeah, so, so all, all phases can exist. All substances can exist in all phases. So I'm going to throw this to you. You ready? So this is just, this is air. Literally, inside here is air, which is nitrogen and oxygen. You ready? Okay, slosh that around. What's it feel like? It's a liquid. That's actually liquid air. Right, and so, but how do we, because air is nitrogen and oxygen and all these things that we know to be gases, right? So what do we have to do to get that air to turn into a liquid? And the answer is crush it. And that's actually what's in there is air under hundreds and hundreds of pounds of pressure. And when you do that, you can take these molecules and move them so close together that they liquefy. On their own, they don't want to, but you can force them to. Yeah, so that's actually liquid air. Try it. <laughs> yeah, so when you spray it, you're actually taking off the pressure and it turns back into a gas. That's not flammable. No, no, no. So don't confuse that with like hairspray. So hairspray is flammable because the propellant is actually many times butane, which is the same stuff in a Bic lighter. Um, but no, the hairspray is, that's not flammable. I mean, here, toss it back to me. Don't 
don't go. All right, listen to the screencast. So it's not flammable. Wait a second. Oh, you know what? No, no, no. That's, no, watch, this is cool. No, this is called science. So, yeah, but if I do it more, so why is it if I do this, it goes out, but if I do that, if I give it more, it burns? Exactly. If, if, you, if, you squeeze, if you squeeze too much, you're actually dispensing the liquid oxygen, which burns more. So if you do this, it's just like blowing it out. But if you do, ooh. oh, maybe now it won't do it anymore because it's, yeah, now it won't do it because it must be warm enough that it's not liquefying. But yeah, at that first shot, it actually ignited, right? And I think you're right, Jason. It's because initially it dispensed a little bit of the liquid oxygen, which caused it to burn more rapidly. Sure, but I mean, you, you understand the reason is because our, our society is run by lawyers, no offense, and um, we're always just looking to avoid lawsuits. It's the same people that buy cups of hot chocolate and coffee at McDonald's and it says, caution contents is hot. We've got to warn people about the obvious. Um, so, but that's pretty cool. There you go. So guys, you understand the principle? If something is not polar, no intermolecular forces, and it's a gas, is that good? Okay. So guys, let's go on then and let's talk about the next molecule, CH3OH. You don't need to write that down, but you do need to understand the principle. So guys, remember, these molecules are all polar in this basic direction. So right. So because these molecules are polar, what are they going to do when you get them together in big groups? Well, guys, pole that attract, so too molecules that are polar have positive and negative dipoles. And understand, this isn't quite the same as north and south pole, but in the same way that norths and souths attract, positives and negatives attract. And when these things all get together, if they're, and they are, because they're attracting each other, will they be a gas? Do you think molecules that are attracted to each other will be a gas? No. They will actually be a liquid. And guys, that is what is inside this jar, this, this bottle. There is no water inside this bottle. And I know that in your world, anything that looks like this has got to be water. But guys, there is no water inside this bottle. Everything that's inside this bottle are these molecules, CH3OH. For those of you that don't know, this is what is called methyl alcohol. There's no water in there, guys. This is all alcohol. So inside this bottle are just billions of these molecules all attracted to each other. So guys, why are these a liquid and not a gas? Because they're attracted. And what do we call those attractions? Intermolecular forces. And why does it have intermolecular forces? Because they're polar. Do you see the connections? So guys, it goes like this then. This molecule, oh, sorry, I'm drawing dots. Guys, this molecule is polar, therefore it does have intermolecular forces. And because it does have intermolecular forces, it's a liquid. Mm -hmm. That's a brilliant question. Um, let me let everybody write this down and then let's talk. That's a great question. Exactly. And that's going to be the answer to the question. Yeah, because that's what freezing is, is taking a liquid and turning it into a solid. So we're going to answer the question sort of backwards. You guys all caught up? Because, guys, the question on the table, if I can paraphrase for you, is what has to happen for it to be a solid? So let me answer that in a different way. 
Because what about this? Why is this not a solid? Why is alcohol not a solid at room temperature if it's got intermolecular forces that attract them together? And guys, the answer is this. What are, if, if you could get down inside this bottle and you could see these molecules, do you know what they're doing? Well, but what would they look like? What would you see if you could see these molecules? Are they standing still? No, they're moving very, very rapidly, and they're crashing into each other, and they're crashing into the walls of the container. And guys, how do we measure the speed at which they're moving? You know what that's called? Temperature. Guys, that's all temperature is, is the speed at which the molecules. So guys, literally, if you stick a thermometer in something, it's literally a speed gun for molecules. The higher the temperature, the faster the molecules are moving. So here then is the answer to your question. Why is this not a solid? And the answer is because the temperature of the room, which is also the temperature of this, the temperature of the room is high enough that these molecules can't lock together. So what would it take to turn these into a solid? Cool them down. And if you cool them down, you slow them down, and eventually they move slowly enough that they lock in place and they become a solid. Does that make sense? And then the other would be true. If it were a solid, if you add energy to it, it would melt. Go ahead, Mark. Of the molecules themselves, nothing. Let's do this. Let's go to water, because we're more familiar with it, and then let's answer that question. So guys, are you good on this idea? Polar molecule, intermolecular forces, liquid. Is that good? OK, so guys, what about this then? Let's talk about liquid water. So guys, are these molecules polar? They are, right? Therefore, do they have intermolecular forces? They do. Therefore, and I know that you know this, but let's just, guys, water is also a liquid. So guys, the relationships are the same. Polar molecule, intermolecular forces, again, you don't even need to write it down because you already did. Polar molecules, intermolecular forces, this is a liquid. So let's talk about what this might look like. So guys, if you could look down inside a jar of water, this is literally what you would see. All these water molecules are all mishmashed together. They're moving at hundreds of miles an hour. They're smashing into each other. They're smashing into the container. It is literally chaos inside there. But guys, they're not as solid because they're moving so quickly that they can get past each other. But if you can slow them down, by cooling them down, eventually they lock in place and they turn into this, which is what? Ice. This is what ice looks like. So Mara, the answer to your question is this. What does that do to the molecules themselves? Nothing. A water molecule in its liquid state and a water molecule in its gas state look exactly the same. What it does do is change the structure within the substance. Here, there's no structure. Liquids are random, chaotic systems. If you slow them down enough, though, and you're going to see videos on this next Wednesday, if you, ah, everybody but, you see, you can, <laughs> there you go. But, but guys, what happens then is if you slow these down enough, they then lock into position, and this is what it looks like inside of an ice cube. So the molecules don't change, but here's the interesting question. What do the purple sticks represent? Not bonds, intermolecular forces. So here, there are intermolecular forces, but there's enough energy that the intermolecular forces are always moving and changing. Here, the intermolecular forces, as represented by the sticks, are locked in position, and that's what makes it solid. So your question then was going back, back, why, what, why isn't this then a solid? And so what we've got to do is slow it down enough that these intermolecular forces can lock in position and make it a solid. So you can freeze this just like you can freeze water. Just a second, Jason, go ahead. Green or black? What? Fight, it's carbon. Same thing. So, the, so, it's, so this is graphite, and it's all carbon, right? So the gray sticks represent covalent bonds. So if you, look at, if you look in graphite, you'll see that the graphite bonds together into six-membered rings that then extend 
throughout the substance. So it's just a chain of interconnected six member rings held together by intermolecular forces. Um, and it turns out that these intermolecular forces are very, very weak. Why they even exist in the first place, we're not going to talk about in this class because these are very nonpolar. Uh, you'll find out in AP that even nonpolar things can have very weak intermolecular forces. Um, but this is held together by weak intermolecular forces, which is what makes this so brittle because these are easy to break. Is that okay? Good, Jason. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. No, no. I, so let, we'll get to those terms in a minute, but let me answer your question. So this... This is co so the forces of attraction that keep this a liquid cohesion. The forces of attraction that keep this a liquid cohesion. The forces of attraction that cause this to be ice also cohesion because all of those are forces within the substance. So what then is adhesion? Adhesion would be alcohol and water dissolving together. So when you mix those together, you may know that alcohol dissolves in water. If it didn't, bartending would be not a job because that's what bartenders do is mix alcohol and water. And so when alcohol and water dissolve together, that's adhesion because it's an attraction between two different substances. So within a substance is cohesion. I'm just going to put this on the floor. Um, within a substance is cohesion. Between substances is adhesion. Is that okay? Go ahead, Mark. I don't remember before Christmas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Adhesion. Correct. So sugar dissolves. I love that you're. Don't go. Sugar dissolves in water, and those forces are cohesion. So why does sugar not dissolve in gasoline? Because there are no cohesive forces. Yeah, you got it. You guys, go ahead. Yeah, it's good. Yes. Yeah, look. Can you see it? Yeah, it's because of these big open spaces. This and, and water is the only substance that does this when it freezes. When other substances freeze, they pack together really tight. They become more dense. But it turns out, because of the polarity and the size and the shape of water molecules, when they freeze, they spread out. So you can literally see that the liquid is more dense than the solid because when this freezes, these forces cause it to expand and it literally gets bigger and all this space in here is empty. It's not air, it's, there's nothing in there. It literally becomes less dense because of this space that gets created. It's exactly why ice cubes float, yeah. answer, right? At the University of Utah, they're doing research right now that could legitimately get them a Nobel Prize looking at why water does this. We know the easy answers and that's what we can talk about, but it's even crazier than that. But so the question is, why is water the only substance that does it? And there's the answer goes like this, because it's the only substance on earth that is this small, this bent and this polar. And it's really, that's it. There's no other molecule on Earth that is, that is so small and so polar and yet so bent that when they get together, they push on each other. And literally, that's why it does this. Go ahead, Ford. Yes. Yeah. It'll, it'll deform. Yeah, it'll, oh yeah, you, I mean, there's YouTube videos about pushing the, it's called the elastic limit, the point right before those things fail, um, because they do a lot of this trying to find plastics and metals that would make better pipes so that they deform rather than break, because when they break, it floods your house. So they actually do science on that. And so if it doesn't break, you'll just see it gets big bulges in it. Um, which is why in a lot of times now they use plastic pipes in our houses called PEX because PEX can stretch without failing where copper doesn't many times. So yeah, good question, yeah. 
Okay, I want you to know I did watch Avengers last night, Infinity Wars, getting ready for the new one. So, and Ant-Man wasn't in it, which was a little disappointing. What about Ant-Man? I saw Ant-Man. I just was, what about what? Oh, and, oh, okay, I see where you're going. Yeah, so the, the amount of force that freezing water can exert is crazy. I mean, it can break pipes. It, we don't get this in Utah. In Wyoming, it's horrible. In the winters, you get these things called frost heaves in the freeway because anywhere the freeway cracks, water gets down in that crack in the summer. And then when it freezes, it expands. And we'll look it up in a minute if we have time. You get these things called frost heaves where literally the frozen water in the ground can lift the roadway like feet and you look at the freeway and it looks like a mogul field on a ski run and it's because of that it's because because that water exerts enough force it can literally lift the freeway feet in the air it's crazy yeah unbelievable you guys good on the ideas okay so guys I've got a question then for you and then we're gonna move forward so why is CH4 a gas nonpolar therefore no intermolecular forces. Guys, why is both methanol and water a liquid? Polar molecules, therefore, intermolecular forces, therefore, it sticks together and it's a liquid. But now, guys, we're done, right? We did CH4, we did CH3OH, and we did water, so we're out of examples. What did I not give you an example of? A solid. So what would have to be true of a substance in order to be solid at room temperature? even more polar and therefore even stronger intermolecular forces. An example of that would be sugar. Guys, sugar, and we're not even going to draw it, but sugar is a wonderfully polar molecule. It actually has, depending on the sugar, up to dozens of little polarities all around this molecule and all of those polarities add up to a very polar molecule and that's why sugar sticks together no pun as a solid that's but it's really true that's why sugar is sticky because the, that's all sticky is guys sticky is just intermolecular forces and so those very very polar molecules are sticky and they stick together as a solid please Hold on. No. So you said the more polar a molecule is, the faster it's moving. No. So, so polarity has nothing to do with speed. You can have a really polar molecule moving really fast or a really polar molecule moving really slow. Speed is a function of temperature. So the higher the temperature, the faster it's moving. Maybe the more polar a molecule is, the faster it has to go in order to become a liquid or a gas. Yeah. That's true. That is definitely true. And that's what we're about to talk about. You guys caught up? Okay. So now, guys, we're going to talk about just liquids. So we are now going to put CH4 away. We're done with natural gas. And, guys, we're just going to talk about water and alcohol. And we are going to look at how alcohol is different than water. And the first one that we're going to talk about is volatility. So guys, it goes like this. Volatility is a measure of a liquid's ability to evaporate. So let's get a beaker of water and let's talk. All right, so it goes like this. If we have a beaker of water, which we now do, and let's pretend this is pure water even though you know it's not. We'll talk about the stuff that's dissolved in here at the end of the unit. So guys, we've got a beaker of water. And you understand now that those molecules are moving at hundreds of miles an hour. They're slamming into each other. They're slamming into the glass. It is pure craziness in there. But guys, if you were to come back in a few days, what would you see in that beaker? Nothing. Maybe, certainly less, maybe nothing. The question is why? Where did the water go? I love, what, yeah, I, I love that you guys are doing this. But actually, that's what's happening. Because, guys, not only do these molecules crash into the beaker and crash into each other, sometimes they run into the surface 
of the, of, of the liquid. And when they get to the surface, what's keeping them from just jumping out? intermolecular forces, right? Guys, this is what it looks like inside the liquid. You've got these molecules that are sitting at the surface and they're being held back by intermolecular forces. But what if they have enough energy to break the intermolecular forces? Then they go, woohoo, and they jump out and they leave as a gas. And guys, we call that evaporating, right? So here's the trick. Not all these molecules in a liquid are moving the same speed. Some are moving a little faster, some are moving a little slower. And the ones that are moving faster will work their way to the top of the surface and then they will jump out and they will evaporate. But guys, which ones jump out? Here's an interesting connection. Which ones jump out? The ones that are moving faster. So which ones are left behind? The ones that are moving slower. That's why we sweat. What is, guys, what does sweating do? Cools us off. Why does sweating cool us off? Because your body coats itself in water and the water evaporates. And when the water evaporates, which one leaves? The fast, hot ones. Which ones stay behind? The cooler ones, and that's why sweating cools you off. Huh? Yeah. But, guys. In order for those molecules to leave, they have to break the intermolecular forces. Now do this with me. Guys, join me up here and think about this. Now we're going to look at water and alcohol. Which one has got stronger intermolecular forces, the water or the alcohol? The water. The water. Why the water? It's more polar. Remember what we did at the beginning of the day? We said water is more polar than alcohol, and we proved it by doing the math. Guys, water is more polar than alcohol. Because water is more polar than alcohol, what should be true of its intermolecular forces? Stronger or weaker? So water is more polar. Will its IMFs be stronger or weaker? Stronger. Now, if this has got stronger intermolecular forces, is it harder or easier to jump out? harder. So this, here's the logic, strong, more polar molecules, stronger intermolecular forces, harder to get out. Guys, these are less polar molecules, weaker intermolecular forces, easier to get out. And guys, I can prove this to you. Spill a little bit of water here. Spill a similar amount of alcohol here. Now, what are these liquids doing? They're evaporating, right? But I'm going to make them evaporate a little bit faster by spreading them out. Why does spreading them out make it evaporate faster? More surface area, so there's more place where they can leave. Now, guys, here's the trick. I don't know. You're welcome to stand up. Guys, the alcohol is almost gone. And the water, that's going to be here by the end of the day. And actually, now the alcohol is gone. Why did the alcohol evaporate more quickly? Weaker intermolecular forces. Why does it have weaker intermolecular forces? Lower polarity. And guys, we just saw that. This is dry. This is gone. This is gonna, I'm going to have to clean this up at the end of the day. So why is it that water evaporates? Why is it that water is less volatile? Because it's got stronger intermolecular forces because it's a more polar molecule. Do you get the idea? Guys, we represent it like this. The idea is this. Stronger, higher polarity. Notice the up arrow. Higher polarity means stronger intermolecular forces. Therefore, a lower volatility. If you want to write water next to that, you can. So guys, the higher the polarity, therefore it will have stronger intermolecular forces, therefore it'll have a lower volatility. It doesn't evaporate as easily. And then guys, the opposite is also true. The lower the polarity, therefore will have weaker intermolecular forces, therefore will have a higher volatility, and that's the alcohol. Yeah? So do you uh, combine alcohol and water? Yeah? That's brilliant. So what if we mix them together? 
And the answer is, if you were to let that sit, all the alcohol would evaporate and then all the water would evaporate. That's how you make moonshine. Literally, that's how a still works. You take, you take barley, you take grains, you take sugars and add yeast, and the sugars feed on, I'm sorry, the yeast feeds on the sugar and it makes alcohol. So as you're making moonshine, or this is how they make all whiskeys and things like that, you literally let yeast feed on sugar, and when it does, it makes alcohol, and you end up with a mixture of alcohol and water. Then what you do is heat that up, and because the alcohol is less polar, it has lower intermolecular forces and a higher volatility, and as you heat it, all the alcohol evaporates, and you collect that alcohol, and that's what a moonshine still does. It simply heats up that mixture, the alcohol goes away first, and the water stays behind, and you collect the alcohol, and that's moonshine. It's called fractional distillation, because you're breaking it into fractions by heating it. Yeah? Is it more what? Yeah, that's hard. If you graph it, the answer is yes, but not forever. Um, so if you were to graph temperature versus, versus um, density, um, the, the, if, if you're a liquid, as temperature goes up, the water, the density drops a little bit into like 0.4 degrees Celsius or something like that, and then it goes up like any other substance. It spreads out as it heats. Yeah, Lauren. Depends on temperature. Um, yeah. Yeah, why? It's exactly the sun. The sun is giving energy to that water that breaks the intermolecular forces and causes them to leave. Yeah, that's the water cycle. Go ahead, Ford. Say that again. Well, I mean, yeah, so why does alcohol make us drunk? And that, that's a neurotransmitter thing, that the alcohol gets up inside your brain and it short, it short circuits some of the neurotransmitters in your brain, and that's what that experience is about. But why does the alcohol do that? It's because of its polarity. Absolutely. Yeah, because, you, I mean, our bodies are just these amazing chemical experiments that all depend on molecules moving around because of polarity. So, yeah, because of the polarity and size of that molecule, it just fits right into those neurospaces, and that's absolutely. Yeah. You guys good on this idea? Okay, so now let's take this to the next step. We understand volatility, which is evaporating. Guys, now let's talk about boiling. Just one second. Let me make the transition, and then we'll answer the question. So guys, in order to understand picture, ready? Let's start with water. So guys, this is water, and let's say this is, and watch, this is the idea. This is water at room temperature. What are these molecules doing? They're moving around, they're crashing into each other, the fast ones go woohoo, and they jump out, and we call that evaporating, right? So guys, what happens if we heat this up? Put it on a Bunsen burner. What happens? What happens to the molecules? They start moving faster and faster and faster. And they start moving, they start going crazy. And eventually, guys, they get to the temperature when they start to boil. What happens at that temperature? They are they are all now now moving fast and nothing to leave. So guys, so this guys, is the idea. The idea. At, room At room temperature, temperature some of them are moving fast, fast to enough to leave. We call that, we call that evaporating. evaporating. If you if heat you them up the to boiling, boiling, they now all have enough energy, energy to leave. They're just, they're just waiting again to get to the top, top so that they, so they can do it. And guys, and that's, that's the difference between evaporating, evaporating and, boiling. and boiling. Both of them are a failure of intermolecular forces, but evaporating happens when it's few of them have enough energy to leave. Boiling happens when all of them have enough energy to leave. They're just waiting to get to the surface, and they're waiting to turn. You get the idea? Well, cooking is a function of energy, right? And so the more energy you add to the water, the more energy the water has to add to your food. So absolutely. The reason, that it, the reason we think about boiling with cooking is because boiling is the highest temperature we can get liquid to. So we just get it there because that's the most energy. So guys, do this with me now. Back to water and alcohol. 
Here's the idea, guys. This is the big idea here. So let's talk about this. What do you know about the intermolecular forces in water, stronger or weaker? Guys, don't miss this. The intermolecular forces in water, are they stronger or weaker than in the alcohol? Water's stronger, right? So if it's stronger, the intermolecular forces are stronger. And if the intermolecular forces are stronger, should it boil at a higher or a lower temperature than the alcohol? Higher temperature. Because if the attraction is stronger, therefore, you need to add more energy to break the attraction and get it to boil. And guys, it's actually true. You are, well, here, let's do this then. So the higher the polarity, the stronger the intermolecular force is, the higher the boiling point. And guys, the inverse is also true. The lower, oh, and so, well, here, sorry, this is all messed up. Let me just catch up with you. So, the higher the polarity, the stronger the intermolecular force is, the higher the boiling point. This is still wet, by the way. So guys, you already know, you don't need to write this down, but you already know this, right? Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. What do you think alcohol will boil at, higher or lower? Why lower? Weaker intermolecular forces. Why weaker intermolecular forces? Less polar, because it actually boils at 65 Celsius. You don't need to know those numbers. But water actually boils 45 Celsius, which is about 90 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than, uh, than methanol. No, no, no. This is, this is uh, Celsius. In Fahrenheit, that's about 145. So, but... No, 90 degrees warmer. So, so alcohol boils 90 degrees cool. So this is 212 Fahrenheit. Oh, gosh. That's 100 Celsius is 212 Fahrenheit. So if this is 212, then 65 would be 130, thereabouts. So 65 Celsius is about 130 Fahrenheit. So we don't, here we don't get, oh, but like in Saudi Arabia they do. Right? On a really hot day in the Middle East, it gets to 130, so maybe methanol would boil there. That'd be crazy. <laughs> yeah. That is scary. You guys good on these ideas? We got two more to go and then we're done. Oh, you had a question. Sorry, Rachel. Go ahead. No. So, good question. So, the question, so the, the, the no but. So the question was, because the air gets more, water gets more dense, how does that relate to swimming and things like that? So, I mean, understand that, that swimmers don't breathe the air in the water, but neither do fish, right? Fish do not breathe the, the, the oxygen in H2O. Fish breathe oxygen dissolved in the water. So why do swimmers like a colder pool? And frankly, the answer is because the warmer we are, the faster our metabolism speeds up and the more oxygen we need. Um, and so if you can be cooler, you can slow down your metabolism and, and reduce your oxygen needs so you can focus more of the oxygen that you're breathing to the, the race you're trying to swim and not just trying to stay alive. So, you guys good? Two more to go. So guys, now we're going to do adhesion and cohesion, and then we're going to wrap this up. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what temperature, I mean, what temperature does water freeze at? 32 Fahrenheit, zero Celsius. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and we're going to talk a lot more about this Monday and Wednesday. Um, but yeah, absolutely. No question. Yeah. Well, so understand there's a difference between feeling freezing cold and actually being frozen, yeah, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so, so it's really morbid, but I mean, given, so you're dead, right? We got to assume you're dead. So what time, at what temperature does dead you freeze? Um, if we're mostly water, that would be 32. But 
understand that anything mixed into the water causes it to freeze at a lower temperature. Um, and so because your, the water in your body also has cells and things in it, it would be colder than that. How much colder, I don't know. But you'd freeze below 32. The reason that you don't now is because you're alive and you're producing heat. Um, but if you were dead, you'd freeze somewhere slightly below 32 Fahrenheit. There you go. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Relative, oh, 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 good question. So yeah, what's the big picture here? Is, is water like crazy polar? And I have to be careful what I say, um, but water is so freakishly polar that if you compare it, and forgive me, we do this in AP, um, but if you compare water to other molecules that are similar but not quite the same, water, is like off the charts, polar, off the charts, weird compared to any other substance. And it brings us back to the question, if that's true, then why is so much about life based in water? Um, coincidence, evolution, creation, you make sense of that. But there's something almost poetic to the fact that water is such a cool molecule and such a simple molecule, and yet the foundation of everything. It's pretty cool. You're going to find out in a couple months that water is also an acid and a base. Acids give away hydrogen. Bases give away OH. And so not only is it really small and really polar and really fascinating and the only substance on Earth that expands when it freezes, it's also perfectly an acid and perfectly a base. It's pretty cool. OK, so guys, let's do this. Adhesion and cohesion. Don't try to draw this, but let's talk. Guys, test tube. Here's the water. I hate that they did this. In their drawing, their water molecules have red hydrogens and blue oxygens. That's distracting. But guys, what do we call this dip at the surface of the water? Do you remember? The meniscus. Now, why does water do this? Here's the answer. It sticks to the sides. But guys, why does water stick to the sides? Well, those are intermolecular forces. Stickiness is IMFs. So guys, here we've got polar water molecules. But guess what? Glass molecules are polar too. How do we know that glass molecules are polar? Because they're a solid. So they're really polar. Because if they weren't really polar, they'd be a gas, right? So. We know that the molecules inside the glass are polar, and we've got polar glass, and we've got polar water, and those attract, and it draws the water up the sides of the container, and we call that the meniscus. Huh? Now, guys, is that adhesion or cohesion? This is adhesion because it's an attraction between two different substances. So that is an example of adhesion. Is that okay? Then what about this guy, a water strider? And guys, water striders are more dense than water. They should sink. But what is it that allows a water strider to walk on the surface of water? We call it surface tension. Guys, literally, if you go back to our understanding of water, all of these water molecules are attracted to each other. And that creates a skin on top of the water. And those forces that attract the water molecules to each other, creating a surface that we call surface tension, these water striders are actually able to walk on top of that skin created by the water molecules attracting one another. Yeah, let me show you. Yep, that's also why this works, that you can take it doesn't work in a beaker because of the spout, but Lauren's exactly right. You can take an Erlenmeyer flask and fill it fuller than the lip of the flask, and that's that, that force that allows that water to be higher than the lip, exactly, and that's called surface tension. Now, is that adhesion or cohesion? That's cohesion, and guys, that's what causes these things to stick together. You get the idea? We good? Interesting stuff, right? 
we're like lighting stuff on fire and all right anyway so guys grab your homework and let's talk about how we're going to wrap this up I really thought we were going to have 30 minutes to do homework, but I love that we don't because it means we got to talk about cool stuff. So guys, let's look at this homework assignment and let's make sure you know how to do this. So guys, looking at the arrows page, these are all the arrows that you drew in homework. So let's do the first one together. I gave you up arrow for boiling point. That means high boiling point. So guys, if it's a high boiling point, moving to the left, is that strong or weak intermolecular forces? Strong, so up arrow for intermolecular forces. So high boiling point, high IMFs. Guys, if it's high IMFs, is that a high or a low polarity molecule? Let's do the next one. Guys, low polarity. If we have a molecule that's low polarity, what do we know about the intermolecular forces? Low. What will be true of the boiling point? Also low. So guys, number one was water. Number two is alcohol. And you're going to do the rest. Then guys, turning the page, you've already done number two, right? So you're the second page, you have already identified the more, the more polar molecules. So guys, look at number one. Methyl chloride. Okay, now with that in mind, turn the page again. Here's what it says. Regarding the molecules you just drew, answer the following questions. So number one says this. Regarding set one, which one has the stronger cohesive forces? So guys, the logic goes like this. Strong cohesive force. Is that high or low intermolecular force? Strong attractions, high intermolecular forces. So guys, which one will have the high intermolecular force, the more or the least polar? The more polar. So you go back to the previous page, which one was more polar, methyl chloride or methyl bromide? Methyl chloride, so that would be the choice. So your answer to that one might say, methyl chloride will have the stronger cohesive forces because it's the more polar. You get the idea? And guys, I thought you were clear on this. Maybe I should have given you this. The more polar, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the adhesive and cohesive forces. Sorry, I thought, I thought we were good on that, but maybe not. So guys, we're going to grade this on Monday. We are going to go into lab on Monday. And uh, then on Wednesday, we're going to workshop your labs and tear them apart. It's a good day.